-hmm. I decided to give a slightly different lecture, which is less abstract and applies my ideas about secularism to the Indian context. Originally, I didn't feel confident enough to present those views to such an well-informed audiences as, as yours, but Ananya convinced me that there might be enough there to have a productive conversation. Okay, so that's what I do in the lecture. I apply the abstract ideas that Rashmi was referring to, but to, uh, to, to, uh, to India, to Indian secularism. Okay, modern uh, liberal democratic states are secular in the sense that political sovereignty does not rest on religious authority. I want to call this the basic principle of secularism, which I understand here as a political principle, not as a substantive ethical doctrine about the truth or falsity of religion. But beyond this basic political principle, it's unclear what the idea of secularism can tell us about justifiable or desirable modes of political governance. Admittedly, there's a tendency within academic Western political theory from uh, John Rawls to Martha Nussbaum to applaud the US model, to applaud the US, the US separationist model of free exercise and non-establishment to present it as the paradigm of an ideal liberal democracy. But one uncomfortable implication seems to follow, however, that the rest of the world tragically falls short of liberal standards. This is because most people in the world live under regimes that are either what have been called constitutional theocracies, where religion is formally enshrined in the state, or where religious affiliation is a pillar of collective identity, or where governments actively recognize and support or hinder and control religious institutions. So in countries otherwise as different as Ireland, Poland, Germany, England, Egypt, Israel, Turkey, Indonesia, Senegal, India, and many, many others, politics and religion are interconnected in ways that belie any US style separationism. Recognition of this deep diversity has spurred a new field of scholarly inquiry, that of comparative secularism which over the last 30 years or so has immensely enriched our understanding of the historical contextual factors that have presided over the emergence of distinctive national settlements. However, this shift towards descriptive or thickly descriptive interpretations of the multiple secularisms of our times has its own blind spot seems to me that we've lost sight of the original question, what kind of secularism is required for liberal democracy? So the study of comparative secularism has helpfully, I think, put to rest the idea that the liberal democratic credentials of any state should be a measure of its distance from US separationism. But it has not offered any set of alternative normative criteria by which one can assess the legitimacy of existing religion state arrangements. So in this lecture, I tried to do just that. And I tried to do that by drawing on some ideas from my recent book called uh, Liberalism's Religion, and also by introducing some new thoughts about one prominent example of non-US secularism, that of post-1947 India. So I'm not an expert of India, so I refer to and I defer to existing literature, albeit with some trepidation given its sheer size and intricacy. But fortunately for me, most of it is in English. Uh, but my excursions into Indian political and constitutional thought are, I hope, guided by what I take to be, what I take to be one fundamental lesson of comparative political theory. And this is that the project of comparison should not take as its focus the answers that different societies give to the same question, because it seems to me that different societies ask, themsel ask themselves different questions. So more ambitiously, perhaps, we might learn something from the questions that different societies have asked that might themselves be relevant to our starting predicament. So it is, I shall suggest, in the case of India. Uh, my ambition in the lecture is mostly conceptual and structural, so I don't attempt to develop first-order substantive answers to specific political religious controversies. Rather, I try to 
provide a, a framework for thinking about what is at stake in them. And it's quite a radical framework as it happens, because I shall argue that the twin concepts of secularism and of religion can obscure more than illuminate what is at stake. So at best, I argue, what we need is a minimal secularism, itself connected to a plural, disaggregated conception of religion. So let me start with a diagnostic of the conceptual problem, starting with, uh, with India. So India uh, is the largest secular democracy in the world. The great majority of the population identifies Hindu and 14% of the population are Muslims which makes India the third largest Muslim country in the world. So following the end of British rule and the trauma of partition, the founders of the newly independent nation sought to reassure Muslims that India would not be a Hindu state. And they converge on a rejection of what was pejoratively called communalism. And they championed instead a secular national identity that both recognized and transcended religious identities. So India's constitutional identity alternated between Nehru's professed indifference towards religion and Gandhi's commitment to equal respect for all religions. So in practice, uh, Indian secularism does not uh, formally establish any religion, but respects them all. Formal disestablishment, so that's US separationism, was rejected so as not to stand in the way of reform of the most illiberal practices associated with Hinduism, not to be around the status of women and the lower caste. In parallel, rights of religious collective autonomy were granted to Muslims, in particular, the preservation of Islamic personal law, or Sharia. So this complex uh, secular settlement has been constitutionally resilient, albeit politically fraught and fragile. It has notoriously been exploited by the political class to foster electoral clientelism along religious lines and sometimes to tolerate or even encourage communal violence. Over the last 20 years or so, Congress secularism has been attacked by the Hindu nationalists of the BJP, who originally drew on the rhetoric of secularism and nationalism to reject what they saw as the Congress party's communalist pandering to minorities. So although positive references to secularism remain ubiquitous in Indian political discourse, at least until recently, what the concept refers to has become increasingly nebulous. And secularism is routinely described as being in a state of crisis in contemporary uh, India. So how secular is India? And when I say India, I mean the constitutional system of India. How does it relate to Western, particularly US, secularism? And of course, the US-India comparison is promising, not only because of the paradigmatic status of US separationism, but also because both states combine, both societies combine a secular state with a highly religious society. So roughly in the Indian liter literature um, or the literature about India, we can identify three different normative or evaluative assessments of Indian secularism. The first one, perhaps the first one historically, is that India's is an imperfect secularism. So in his uh, seminal 1963 book, uh, India as a Secular State, the distinguished scholar Donald Smith praised India for its unique constitutional experiment in combining religious freedom with cultural diversity. Ultimately, however, it judged India to fall short of the more mature US model because the Indian state tolerated flagrant breaches of state religion separation. It authorized intrusive interference in religious institutions as well as state direct aid to religion. A second more positive assessment is that India offers an alternative secularism. So it's not an imperfect secularism, it's an alternative. A valid one. So its most sustained advocate, the most sustained advocate of this view has been Rajiv Bhargava, who over a number of important works has sought to secure the credentials of Indian secularism as a 
religion friendly, even handed, even handed model of governance of diversity, respectful both of individual and of collective rights. The third position is more radically skeptical, and this casts secularism as inappropriate for India. So for prominent intellectuals such as Madan and Nandi, secularism is a European colonial import that is rooted in an ethnocentric, ultimately Christian set of distinctions between the religious and the secular, and associated contrast between politics, culture, and spirituality. The Protestant, the specifically Protestant categories of belief and conscience are at odds with the communal complexities of Indian society and the structuring role of religion in everyday life. So on their view again, secularism in India has empowered acculturated political and judicial, judicial elites to deploy the arbitrary power of the state in ways that have only fueled communal divisions and distracted attention from indigenous traditions of toleration. So what I've done is to briefly sketch three common interpretations of Indian secularism, an imperfect, an alternative, or an inappropriate secularism. But, and I want to suggest that despite their differences, they suffer from not dissimilar infirmities. So if you start with a Smith diagnosis of imperfect secularism, that only makes sense if, you, if you've established that the model in question is in fact a model. So you, need, you can only assume that India is imperfect if you've, if you've established that the US model is the, the model. Yet to assume that the only legitimate secular state is one that strenuously avoids any support or recognition of religious groups is to conflate two levels of analysis. The first is what I call the basic principle of secularism, which demands that the state not derive its authority from religious sources, nor lend its authority to them. But the second is the more derivative question of the kind of actual policies and laws that a secular state can engage in. And here, policies of positive support may be demanded by the realization of secular ideals such as effective freedom of religion or the achievement of substantive equality between different religious groups. So in some strict separation between state and religion is only valuable as a means towards other political ends. It is in and by itself normatively underdetermined and it can't serve, serve as a benchmark again, against which non-US secular states are assessed. Rajiv Bhargava's elaboration of an alternative secularism is more promising, insofar as it's deliberately and consciously value-based. According to what he calls principled distance, the state intervenes or refrains from interfering, depending of, on which of the two better promotes religious liberty and equality of citizenship. The problem with the view, I think, is that Bhargava presents principal distance, not as a regulative ideal, but, but as an actual description of what the Indian state does. So we cannot know which policies and laws are in fact principled or at least compatible with the principles. So much like Smith then, Bhargava assumes a felicitous congruence between the ideals that secularism is supposed to foster on the one hand and the specific national models that he favors on the other. So as a result, his account of secularism lacks critical purchase. So this problem of, I call it the problem of idealization also mars the inappropriate secularism account, but in an opposite way. So when you look at the critique of the, the skeptics of, of secularism, the real politic root and branch critique of the actual functioning of secular power and its constant reconfiguration of religion is invaluable. But what is unclear is the normative standpoint of the critique. That is, secular power might be oppressive, and it often is, but how about non-secular power? So critics' strident rejection of all liberal democratic ideals and their implicit romanticization of a pre-colonial, pre-secular India uncomfortably play sometimes into the hands of illiberal Hindu nationalism. 
So this brief um, excursus into Indian secularism, it seems then, has confused more than it has enlightened us. Because whether you look in the US or in India, the two largest secular democracy, it seems that in both countries, the concept of secularism seems to mix descriptive and normative levels of analysis, such that we lack a normative criterion of evaluation to assess whether this or that policy of law is actually congruent with a liberal democratic principles. What kind of secularism do we need for liberal democracy? The question still stands, seems to me. So here's the proposal, and that's the second part of the lecture. So here, I suggest that we should change the question. So instead of asking, is this or that state secular? Or does it respect separation between politics and religion or between state and religion? Instead, we should ask, does this state adequately protect liberal democratic ideals? So this may sound like a subtle or indeed anodyne change, but it carries profound implications. Because the rhetoric of secularism invites us to think about how the state should relate to an integrated, self-contained, naturalized sphere called religion. Whereas my, by contrast, my proposal begins by articulating fairly abstract liberal democratic ideals. He then asks how state policy and laws can protect or promote these ideals in relation to the different dimensions that have historically been associated with what we call religion. So I try to be more sensitive to the complexity of that phenomenon we call religion. So in my book, uh, Liberalism's Religion, I suggest that we disaggregate the concept of religion into a plurality of different dimensions. I identify the different liberal democratic values that minimal secularism helps to sustain. And I suggest that each of them relates to one specific dimension of religion, not to religion as such. And the aim, as hopefully we become clear, uh, is to identify a universal minimal secularism, what, one that is not tied to a particular Western history of secularization, or to Protestant views of conscience, but still one that meets liberal democratic desiderata and therefore can be used as a transnational framework of normative comparison or at least normative dialogue, or so at least I hope. So here's a brief presentation of the main pillars of the theory of minimal secularism. So when we try to think about the normative values, when I, when I, what I mean by normative in analytical, political philosophy, simply the ethical, the desirable values, or the values, let's say. When we think about the values that underpin secularism, I think we can identify three distinct ideals. First one is public justification. Second one is equal inclusion. And the third one is the idea of liberty. So each of these ideals, I argue, picked out different dimensions of religion. But these dimensions are not exclusive to religion. And so perhaps we don't need secularism, which just need to be clear about how to apply liberal democratic ideals to the various elements that make up what we call religion, but that also applies to other similar institutions, beliefs and identities. And the result is what I call minimal secularism. So the basic thought behind minimal secularism is that entanglement of state and religion is problematic for liberal democratic legitimacy because of three features that are typically, though not necessarily or exclusively, associated with religion. The first is the inaccessibility of religious commitments in public reason. So here the thought is that state officials should not appeal to religious doctrines to justify laws and policies that apply to all, because this would compromise the idea of justification in public reason. So on this view, what is wrong with a Christian or a Muslim or a Hindu state is that it, uh, it's incompatible with what we could call the democratic space of reasons, the fact that we share common reasons that we can exchange as within a democratic dialogue. 
The second dimension of religion that is relevant to normative secularism, it's its sometimes divisive dimension as a salient social identity. So here, the state should not endorse one social identity when this undermines the equal civic status of non-members of the recognized group. So here is a different wrong, if you like. So here, what is wrong with a Christian or a Muslim or a Hindu state is that it entrenches the domination of a majority, it entrenches a majoritarian domination. The third relevant dimension of secularism is how it connects to the comprehensive scope of religious conceptions of the good. So here, when we think of a secular state, we think of a state that doesn't coercively impose a religious ways of life, a religious way of life, which covers uh, relationships, sexuality, education, family, eating codes, dress, etc. It doesn't impose that way of life onto its citizens, as this would intrusively regulate the most intimate part of their lives. So here, what is wrong with a Christian or Muslim or Hindu state is that it infringes on liberty, the liberty to live according to one's own conception of the good life, whatever it is. So instead of asking, is this state secular? I think we should ask, how well does this state fare with respect to the principles of equal inclusion, liberty, and public justification? So we have a disaggregated principle of minimal secularism, and we also ha have a denial that religion is uniquely special. I don't think religion is uniquely special for purposes of liberal democratic legitimacy. And it seems to me that this view has a number of uh, advantages. First, it covers all the ideals that we intuitively think secular, or many of us intuitively think that secularism should protect. But it remains agnostic as to whether a wall of separation is in practice the best way to achieve them. So he doesn't make a fetish of Western style separation between state and religion, and therefore it allows a variety of permissible arrangements. It's abstract enough not to idealize any particular national model, which I, I suggested earlier what was wrong with existing uh, theories, but it's also concrete enough to offer a framework for the evaluation of existing practices of political governance of religion. He does not rely on any particular conception of religion. So he's not biased towards individualistic Protestant notions of religion. And it's sensitive to the cultural, customary, but also national and ethnic dimensions of, of, of what religion is or the lived experience of religion. And he doesn't apply only to religion. So the principle of public justification applies to secular beliefs too. The principle of equal inclusion applies to other social identities, not only religion, and the principle of liberty applies to other comprehensive systems of personal ethics. So the upshot is that non-religious philosophies, cultures, and ideologies can exa exhibit exa exactly those features that make religion unsuitable for state endorsement. So uh, on one interpretation of, of French, Laïcité, which is the French for secularism, uh, one interpretation of it is that it's rooted in a very, in a comprehensive secularist and individualistic worldview, for example, that considers Islamic veiling to be incompatible with national identity. Well, this, on my view, is as incompatible with minimal secularism as would be a more traditional religious theocracy, right? So this comprehensive secularism is contestable on exactly the same grounds as forms of illiberal religious establishment. And finally, the disaggregation approach explains why religion is not always unsuitable for state endorsement, if contingently is not accessible, comprehensive, or divisive. So in these cases, recognition of the majority religion by the state is permissible. And while the framework doesn't make religion a special case, he still explains, I hope, the particularly egregious wrongs of political theocracy or illiberal religious establishment. Religion is often inaccessible, comprehensive, and divisive, and this explains why most instances of state religious establishment are indeed illiberal or incompatible with liberal democracy, precisely because they infringe on public justification, equal inclusion, and what I call and, and liberty. So 
I hope the framework makes sense of the notion of comparative secularism, but I also hope that it doesn't collapse into a relativist celebration of diversity. And because it doesn't take separationist policies as the chief indicium of liberal democratic secularism, it avoids the fallacy, which I think is common to much critical literature, of denouncing every political interference with religion as a damning indictment of secularism itself. Okay, so with this framework in mind, we can now uh, return to India. So as you probably know, many people in the West are surprised to hear that there is secularism in India. Um, popular perceptions of India conjure up a bewilderingly diverse, pervasively religious society, marred by chaotic democratic politics and distorted by religious lobbying and clientelism, uh, regular episodes of uh, politically orchestrated communal violence, um, and the persisting religious oppression of disadvantaged groups, such as Dalit and, and women. But India also, at least up to recently, has a resilient secular constitution with a measure of judicial protection of fundamental rights, and the ideals of the secular state have been widely shared, at least fixed reference points in Indian public debate. I'm not sure this is still the case in, in 2021. At any rate, I, I think Western theorists should resist uh, hasty judgments about India, what I, what I call elsewhere the ethnocentrism of comparison. So ethnocentrism of comparison is when you judge your own society by its ideals and other societies by their practices. So that's typically what happens in kind of Western assessment of secularism. You assess the U.S. in relation to religious freedom and gender equality and secularism and human rights. And you judge other societies by their practices, which you see as being all about communal violence and whatnot. And this ethnocentrism of comparison has a double effect of erasing Western deficiency in practice. So clearly, the, for example, the self-congratulatory US celebration of religious tolerance has hidden from view the, the appalling US record of racial integration. But the other effect it has is, is to underestimate the importance of ideals in other societies too. And it seems to me the ideals of secularism might have been frustratingly under-realized, but this doesn't mean that they have no purchase on lived reality. So the relationship between ideal and practice is, is as complex in, 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 any, in both societies and in most societies. However, I think the study of Indian secularism raises its own distinctive challenge. And it is this. Um, seems to me that Indian political and judicial actors invoke secularism to defend what appear to be diametrically opposed policies and ideals. Uh, a a non-communal civic national identity, as well as cultural Hindu nationalism or Hindutva. The protection of minority personal laws, as well as the abolition of minority personal laws, the promotion, but also the dismantling of affirmative action programs, the, toler the toleration, but also the exclusion of religious speech in politics, women's rights, as well as rights of collective religious autonomy. So secularism in public discourse seems to have become what Ernesto Laclau called a floating signifier. So that's an ideologically valued label, but that attaches to no stable meaning. So this will be a depressing conclusion, I think, but, but fortunately it's not quite accurate because it seems to me that debates about secularism in India are in fact very recognizable debates about the best interpretation of the ideals of equal inclusion, liberty and public justification. So in the third and final part of the lecture, I want to make good on this general claim by focusing on equal inclusion and, and liberty. For, for lack of time, I, I leave aside public justification, although there is much to be said on that dimension too, as well. There's a, there's a robust tradition of both democratic and judicial public reasoning in India, uh, uh, as well as vibrant controversies about the legitimacy of certain types of religious speech in the public sphere. But I leave that aside to try to show uh, uh, finally that in India,
secularism is crucially about the interpretation of and the relations between equal inclusion and personal liberty. So let me start with this idea of equal uh, inclusion. Um, and here I go back to the 1950 constitution. So the, the core controversies of Indian secularism have revolved around the status of religious minorities, mostly Muslim, but to a lesser extent, Sikh and Christians and others. India was one of the first countries to give constitutional recognition to the rights of minority communities in its constitution. In truth, the newly formed Constituent Assembly operated a marked retrenchment from the colonial policy of systematic group representation along religious, caste, and racial lines. The British had instituted separate electorates, reserved seats, as well as group quotas in government employment for a variety of enumerated categories, such as the Muslim, Sikhs, Anglo-Indians, so-called depressed classes, untouchables, and so-called backward classes, tribal groups. So the, the Congress party was suspicious of this often cynical divide and rule policy, which seemed to be unsuited to the inclusive nationalism of the newly independent state. But at the same time, the party didn't want a Hindu dominated state, especially after the bloody and traumatic episode of partition and the creation of Pakistan. And so what was called during the colonial era, the minority question persisted after independence and beyond. So what was the minority question? And to me, that's the, that, that's the shape that debates about secularism took in India. Right? It's very different from the US. So the minority question really involved a wide ranging exploration of how to promote the equal integration of minority groups variously defined along caste, religion or tribe. And it's against this background that the place of Muslims, so a religious group, the place, of, the place of Muslims in India was debated. And that's a far cry as should be obvious from Western discussion about church state separation and religious freedom. So the question of the integration of Muslims raised deep and foundational questions about the identity of the Indian nation and the content of citizenship, as well as the structural similarities between different forms of disadvantage and exclusion. Muslims, like the depressed class, classes, formed a salient social group, one structurally vulnerable to underrepresentation and marginalization. So for both groups, the minority question was really one of safeguards against Congress, Hindu or upper, upper caste domin dominance. So crucially, there were two visions of equal inclusion in play within debates uh, in the Const Constituent Assembly. And on those debates, I, I drew on the important work of Roshana Bashpai, who uh, couldn't make it today, but it's always nice to to hear and, and to, to read and see her. So two visions. Uh, the first one was hostile to the recognition of religion, caste and tribe in the political domain and interpreted secularism as equal citizenship rights for all individuals. And here the term secular didn't pertain to religion alone, but to all group affiliations. It was contrasted not with religious, but with communal. And communal was opposed to both secular and national in, in nationalist discourse. Tellingly, Nehru has pro proclaimed that, and I quote, a caste-ridden society is not properly secular. Right? So you can see how, how what the term secular really was, it was a broader conception of, of, of what I call equal inclusion. And much as in France, for that matter, secularism in India was tightly bound up with conceptions of national identity and equal uh, citizenship. But there was an alternative notion of equal inclusion that was influential in parallel, and this emphasized the idea of unity in diversity and the recognition of the diverse components of the Indian nation. So instead of formal equality and the strict separation of between state and cultural and religious identities, this alternative view promoted more substantive notions of equality. And in relation to religion, the ideal was of equidistance of the state vis-a-vis -vis all religious identities 
and an equally positive attitude towards all religious communities. So the non-sectarianism of the state was deemed compatible with policies of differentiated support for minorities. So two visions in practice, the constitution, the 1950 constitution trod a narrow path between these two conceptions of equality. Both of course converged on the rejection of state and state endorsed official religion. So the constitution affirms the neutrality of the state against the aspirations of Hindu traditionalists for a Hinduization of the Republic. But the treatment of the minority question was otherwise complex. So the constitution maintained political safeguards and positive discrimination policies for the scheduled castes and the scheduled tribes. But colonial era political safeguards were taken away from religious minorities. Instead, those minorities were recognized through extensive cultural and religious rights. That's article 25 and uh, 13. And the key concession to minorities was the decision not to force the imposition of, of a uniform civil code in matters of family law. So the colonial practice of leaving communities such as Muslims and Christians to regulate their so-called personal law matters, such as marriage and divorce, was continued. So Article 44 merely states a directive. The state shall endeavor to secure for the citizens a uniform civil code throughout the territory of India, but Nehru in particular feared that any action by the state, uh, any proactive action by the state might cause tension among the Muslims who wanted to feel at home in, in India since they had chosen not to go over to Pakistan. So in sum, debates about equality in India resist the simple formula of non-establishment and separation. The challenge rather was to achieve equal inclusion under multicultural conditions where religion is one of the salient social identities along with caste, race and socioeconomic status. And I now turn to the idea of liberty um, or personal liberty to show that Indian thinking here is also more complex than the simple US First Amendment formula of free religious exercise. So let me turn to personal liberty. So to be sure, freedom of religion is a cornerstone of Indian secularism. So the Indian state has no official religion and is prohibited from extracting taxes for the promotion of religion and is prohibited from dispensing religious instruction in state-maintained schools. However, unlike the United States, the Indian constitution combines freedom of religion clauses with a mandate to the state to intervene in religious affairs. So personal liberty is not simply about freedom of religion, but also freedom in religion. So in particular, Article 25 allows the state to regulate or restrict any economic, financial, political, or other secular activity which may be associated with religious practice. The constitution also provides for social welfare and reform of Hindu religious institutions. Article 152 and 173 prohibit untouchability and practices associated with caste inequality. So as a result, the constitution has sometimes been described as a charter for the reform of Hinduism. And Indian secularism has been characterized by comparativist experts as an ameliorative secularism. So in truth, the Indian experience brings to light the historical connections between secularism and a distinctively modernist project of individual emancipation from the most oppressive dimensions of religion. And here there are striking parallels between uh, uh, French and Indian uh, nation building. The struggles for the emancipation of women occupies a center chapter in the history of Indian nationalism and Hindu social reform witnessed the campaigns against Sati, Parda, child marriages, uh, the prevention of intercaste marriages, etc. Um, although one should never exaggerate the commitment of 19th century powers, including colonial powers, to gender equality. Uh, it's quite interesting about the personal laws, for example, they were crafted you know, mostly by colonial powers in collaboration with the, with the Indian authorities but they interpreted religion in line with their Victorian prejudices. 
with with the with the kind of paradox that sometimes the personal laws uh, entrench more reactionary roles for women than uh, Indian practice and society allowed at the time. That was the case notably on inheritance, where Victorian society was much more conservative than Indian society. At any rate, uh, secularism became associated certainly in the 20th century with uh, the reform of gender rela relations and the practice of plural marriage was at large in the Hindu Marriage Act of 1955 and another significant area of state promoted religious reform as concerned uh, temple entry. The fact that um, Dalit and women were forbidden to enter certain temples and other religious places. And so now, two features of Indian religion, and more specifically of the historically amorphous um, in Hindu religion, authorize these two features um, influence the implementation of this reformist agenda by the state. The first is the contrary to Christianity, there's an absence of centralized theolo theological authority appealing to scriptural orthodoxy and able to implement religious reform internally. The second feature is the fact often commented upon that Hinduism is a way of life more than a set of discrete beliefs and rituals. As uh, Jacobson has put it in India, where faith, faith and piety are more directly inscribed in routine social patterns, judges cannot avoid the perilous jurisprudential vortex of theological controversy as conveniently as their American counterparts. The risk then was that any state promoted reform would be seen as an attack on the integrity of comprehensive communal practices. One solution used by Indian courts has been to define religion in such a way that state intervention would not be a violation of freedom of religion. There's been some precedent for that in the US as well. So in the, in the landmark Mormon case, Mormon polygamy case, at the end of the 19th century, the US Supreme Court drew a distinction between inviolable beliefs, inviolable beliefs and legally challengeable practices and suggested that really only beliefs are protected by the law, not practices. The Indian Supreme Court, for, for its part, rejected this Protestant distinction between belief and practice, but it still sought to legitimize uh, intervention by drawing its own distinctions between essential and non-essential practices, between high and popular spirituality, or between pure religion and superstition. So there's an extensive jurisprudence of the Supreme Court, and it's been quite, quite messy and controversial in this regard, Many have claimed that it's not the role of secular authorities to participate actively in the internal reinterpretation of Hinduism. And critics have interrogated this arbitrary prerogative of secular law to frame and shape religion for its own purposes. But in other ways, it seems to me that Indian courts have been much more lucid and candid about what it is that they were actually doing. So the thought is when a minimal standard of personal liberty is at stake, it turns out that not so much hinges on the definitional question of whether something is classified as being religious. Uh, Rajiv Davan and Fali Nariman summarize the legal situation in this way. They write, judges are now endowed with a three-step inquiry. First, to determine whether a claim is religion. Second, whether it's essential to the faith and perforce whether even if essential, it complies with the public interest and reformist requirements of the constitution, end of quote. So this suggests that the constitutional goal of liberty promoting social reform sometimes required that even essential religious practices and customs be legally challenged. So if caste related exclusions are objectionable, for example, they're also regardless of whether they are essential to Hinduism or not. That's a debate that is generally unwise for courts, secular courts to engage in. So there is something to the critique that uh, secular states are not neutral towards religion. Either they play a role in arbitrarily delimiting what is essentially religious, or they regulate religious practices that too drastically limit the freedom and opportunities of oppressed groups. Either way, 
religion does not have the quasi naturalized status evoked by the war of separation metaphor. So much of the interpretive role of the law is to identify uh, areas of social life that lend themselves to collective intervention in the name of political ideals or liberal democratic ideals. And these areas can be and historically have been central to religious self-understandings, whether it is rules of temple, uh, um, rules of temple entry within Hinduism or rules of marriage, divorce and family in all religions. So the conflict between secular law and comprehensive religious norms is in this sense structurally unavoidable because it is a conflict between competing normative uh, orders. And one way in which this conflict has erupted in India centrally relates to our topic. So I want to say a few words uh, about Shabanoi. So I've tried to show how, um, and I bring this case to understand how equal inclusion and liberty are connected um, and conflicted. So I've tried to show how the stated ideal of India's constitutional secularism is to secure equal inclusion and personal liberty. That is to confront both inter-religious and intra-religious domination, to use the Bhargava's felicitous expression. One problem, of course, is that the two objectives can conflict. So group-based special rights might legitimize practices that infringe on the personal liberty of their members, raising tricky issues concerning the treatment of minorities within minorities. So consider the well-known Shabano case. So Shabano was a divorced elderly Muslim woman who filed for maintenance under section 125 of the criminal procedure claim. Her husband petitioned the Supreme Court, arguing that under Muslim personal law, he was bound up to repay the bride's wealth and a limited period of maintenance. But in a landmark decision, the Supreme Court sided with Shabano and awarded maintenance of 180 rupees per month. And the judges also undertook to interpret Islamic law to bolster their position. They quoted the Quran to the effect that God-fearing people should treat their wives fairly. And they also judged that the fatal point in Islam is the degradation of women and regressing their uniform code had not been adopted. So as, as is well known, the judgment provoked the fury of Muslims who rejected both the substance of the decision and the court claimed to speak authoritatively about the Quran. In 1986, under pressure from self-appointed Orthodox ulemas, the government of Rajiv Gandhi introduced the law, the Muslim Women Protection After Divorce Act, a tragic misnomer as it in practice ensure that Muslim women are not the only ones denied divorce maintenance under the Indian Criminal Code. But for Hindu nationalists, the government's, the government's cowardly response to the Shabana ruling became a rallying cry that led uh, seven years later to the destruction of the Babri Masjid Mosque by Hindu militants uh, in Ayodhya and the rise of uh, right-wing Hindu uh, nationalism. So the Shabano case and its repercussions seems to me are emblematic of the contradictions of Indian secularism. So one key directive of social reform was to replace the diversity of personal laws codified under colonial rule with a uniform code. Yet Muslims were exempted from it on the grounds that the coercive imposition of what they perceived to be a Hindu code would have sent a signal of inferior status to the Muslim community. So it would have undermined their equal inclusion as a group. But paradoxically, the exemption only empowered the more conservative and patriarchal elements of the Muslim community. And when the measure for social status of a group is the power its men have over their women, Minority fears of assimilation and marginalization can have disastrous effects on the status of women. And nor was the status of women improved as a whole in Indian society since these sad events. On the contrary, the Shabano, uh, fueled, uh, the Shabano case fueled the rise of the BJP, who deployed newly discovered feminist rhetoric to criticize the oppression of women by, by Muslim men, 
denounced the appeasement of minorities by the pseudo-secular Congress party and proclaimed its own ag aggressively assimilationist nationalism, all in the name of the spontaneously tolerant and secular Hindu tradition. So let me let me conclude. It seems so we've we've traveled a long way during the lecture, but let me just try to take stock of what I hope we've uh, uh, learned or thought about. The first first lesson is about minimal secularism. So when we interpreted by the broad liberal democratic values of equal inclusion and personal liberty, this is an ideal with transnational relevant. It doesn't single out any particular conception of religion. Secularism picks up alternative religion as a collective social identity, religion as comprehensive ethics, religion, religion as a jurisdictional, jurisdictional authority, and so forth. The second lesson is about Indian secularism. If it falls short, if it falls short, it's not because it fails to maintain an idea of separation, but rather because state efforts towards equal inclusion and personal liberty have been sometimes ineffective or mistargeted. So state promoted reform struggles to reduce as deeply entrenched forms of oppression as those of caste, class and gender. And toleration of personal laws was probably the wrong way to secure the equal inclusion of Muslims. So we can say, I think that if, if India falls short, it falls short of its own stated ideals that are recognizably those of mini, minimal secularism. So my analysis, I hope, is not vulnerable to the critique that the exercise of comparative secularism merely involves the measuring of non-Western societies against a purported model of Western secularism. There are two final lessons uh, actually about and for Western secularism. First, the study of conflicts between law and religion around the world reveals the extent to which secularism everywhere involves a claim about sovereignty. So contrary to what the wall of separation metaphor suggests, there is no naturalized pre-existing sphere of religion that can be walled off from the state. Secular courts in practice draw lines between the religious and the secular, the personal and the political, the private and the public. This meta-secularism, as we could call it, is highly contentious in societies where the legitimacy of rule-bound constitutionalism is not fully secured, as uh, India's Shabano case, as well as many temple entry controversies reveal, I think. But this jurisdictional sovereignty claim is also what is at stake in recent controversies in Western courts concerning the scope of authority of religious associations and the state's role in adjudicating them. And here I'm thinking of cases such as the Osana Table in the US or the Free Jewish School case in the, in the UK. Finally, um, and I conclude, uh, India's contemporary predicament teaches us not to be misled by the positive laudatory connotations of the rhetorical deployment, deployment of the term secularism. After all, India's BJP was originally successful in its campaign to present itself as the truly secular party, presenting Hindutva as a cultural but not a religious party and as a bulwark against religious Islamism. But if we apply the criteria of minimal secularism, we can see that this is not secularism because the BJP doesn't honor any recognizable idea of equal inclusion. It is deliberately and openly uh, anti-Muslim and many observers worry that India has become an ethno-democracy given the impact of Hindu majoritarianism, which has reduced certain religious minorities to the status of second-class uh, citizens. But all things equal, we also witness the exclusionary power of secularized and cultural religion elsewhere, not only in India. In the aftermath of 9-11, feelings of ethnic religion have been reactivated and fears around, also around fears around globalization and migration. So in Europe, for example, studies have shown that people who define themselves as culturally Christian, 
uh, as opposed to believers, so culturally Christian, are more likely to harbor anti-immigrant, anti-Muslim sentiments than their practicing religious counterparts, who are more likely to see foreigners, immigrants, and refugees as brothers. In Britain, many of the nominal Christians uh, identify with the Anglican church or with Christianity in order to signal their identity as white British and in order to distance themselves from minority groups. So the point here, um, and it's an important point I'll, I can only make very quickly, seems to me that cultural religion, culturalized religion, or secular religion, if you like, is not inherently more tolerant or inclusive than belief-based religion. So the upshot of all this is that we should not blindly rely on the intuitive connotations of secularism, good, and religion, bad. We must be prepared to tell more complex stories and to build more subtle arguments about the best way to protect valuable ideals of equality and liberty in pluralistic societies. Thank you.